Okay, so yeah, we'll go ahead and just go through this again. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can hear me a little bit better. I'll try to, I'll try to uh, still speak loud and um, uh, hopefully it's not too disruptive because uh, basically I, I can't let this go. Usually I only do like one live stream and or like one talking video in a row, but yesterday uh, I did another one. <laughs> you know, I did, I released a, an interview, um, but I can't let this go. We've got to talk about when someone who people usually don't argue against or someone really well respected, uh, when he validates what you have to say or what I like, basically what I've been saying for the longest time is that pins are valuable, a very, really valuable part of even the Nogi game, the Nogi grappling game. Um, but then when I say that, right, um, you know, I get all these people commenting and arguing, saying pins are worthless, right? And then, uh, you'll, you know, I, not even just with me, you know, you hear some other people that are into grappling and stuff say it just like, uh, just in general, you know. Um, but so then yesterday, so December 19th, uh, really famous wrestling, or not wrestling, uh, Nogi Guru, John Danaher, uh, made a social media post uh, declaring that pinning is a weapon, right? So when someone who's like so revered around the world in the grappling game, because uh, a few of his students uh, are able to beat so many high-level grapplers, uh, then it's kind of hard for people to then argue or continue arguing against my point. Right. So I really want to bring that evidence in. Right. Because like it doesn't mean uh, and actually it's kind of funny because like a lot of times people might talk about um, being in the minority and sometimes like the majority opinion could be right. But apparently someone who's really revered, John Danaher, is now in the minority or at least has been on now it's on or is, is showing that he's uh, um, like on my side. So. That's why I want to try to, I want to try to definitely keep that going or like let people know about that, right? Because, because not only um, does he agree, but he actually makes some good points and points that I have been making for years now. And uh, it's great to get that corroboration. So let's go ahead and talk about his post. I think you should, yeah, it'll, it'll pop up behind me, but I'll go ahead and read it here because it's actually one of his shorter posts, because usually he writes like long, long paragraphs. Um, it just kind of rambles on, but um, okay. So pinning is a weapon, right? It says we nor so this is John Danaher's uh, writing. So we normally think of submission holds of jujitsu, strangles and joint locks as the weapons of the sport. This is because they are what do the serious damage to an opponent. There is a sense, however, in which high pressure pinning can be a weapon also. They may not break joints or render anyone unconscious, but done well, they can certainly create so much discomfort and claustrophobia that they can make inexperienced opponents submit and even experienced opponents so miserable that they will expose themselves to submissions just to escape that misery. All right, so it goes on for a couple more sentences, but let's go ahead and let's break it down real quick, right? So I think he's a little disingenuous uh, when he says, like, it makes an inexperienced person, um, like, it, it's true, an inexperienced person, they can, what, what, in my experience, <laughs> in my experience, or even saying inexperienced or kind of new wrestlers even get their ribs cracked, right, by the pinning pressure, right? But what we've seen, and we have a big example right, uh, Dean Lister getting submitted or tapping out to pressure in a big grappling match, right? I think everyone kind of references that. Um, so in a way, he's kind of glossing over or making making uh, making it seem like, oh, experienced guy can just be patient and wait it out and whatever. And even in my experience, um, rolling with uh, some, actually a couple black belts, um, they've submitted They've tapped out to pressure, basically, and and actually, it, um, their it, their their rib shifted a little, kind of popped out of place a little bit on both, right? So, I, I would say that's a little bit disingenuous. Trying to, I think, trying to minimize the effectiveness of pinning. So that's why I, I want to also add that it can actually be more 
uh, useful than what he's trying to make it sound. I think in this case, he's kind of diminishing it a little bit, a little bit. But I mean, it's still still important that he's saying stuff like this, right? Okay, but yeah, well, what, what, what is absolutely true is that when you're making someone uncomfortable, when there's a situation where there are no pins allowed, right, or pins pins don't count, then yeah, you're gonna if if they're able to get out, right, then they make themselves vulnerable to getting submitted, right? So okay, so let's go on. Just as you put a lot of study into your favorite submissions, so too must you. Must you outstudy into your favorite pins? Okay, that doesn't make. I think there is some typo in there. <laughs> but anyway, I just studied those pins, right? In particular, learn how to control an opponent through his or her head. Even though most of the heavy pins feature chest to chest positions, it it's not so much weight on the chest that makes opponents miserable as it is the use of their jaw as a lever to control their head. Next time you're pinning your training partners, take your time and let them simmer and cook for a while rather than rushing to the submission. You may well find that submissions come a lot easier when you finally decide to go for it, right? Um, so you can kind of tell, so like in my experience, based on what he's writing, it makes me feel that the, the pins aren't so uh, advanced as to like what he knows, right? And what they're experiencing in their gym uh, because it's not just chest to chest. A lot of times it should be the angles, right? So just kind of like sandwiching someone down, you know, between the mat and your body, that's not really going to be enough to get the submission. So maybe that's why he's talking about like, uh, oh, and you know, just make an experienced person miserable and they'll, They'll want to move and whatever. Um, so that can be why he makes the statements that he does here in this post. But really, you want to be putting pressure at angles, right, and using your feet, right, to drive into the person at an angle. That's the stuff that can crack ribs or, or pop ribs out of place or even uh, make them, make it where they submit because it's really they're having a hard time breathing. Um, if, you know, if you're not cracking ribs and all that stuff. So... Uh, there's more of an art to pinning than I think um, Danaher understands here. But who am I, right? <laughs> well, I'm just happy that um, uh, someone that's like so revered by everybody uh, that, you know, he's uh, corroborating what I've been saying for years. Maybe he um, listens to the podcast or, or watches this, my live streams right? or watches my uh, videos, right? <laughs> right? Uh, you never know, but um, I, I'm kind of, I'm just, I'm just kidding, but um, uh, that's been my point for years, right? So a lot of times, yeah, you, you want to not only think about pinning, kind of like how he says, it's like, it's not just the chest to chest stuff, but it's all these different, um, he says like using ways to control their head. Um, this is what I've been saying too. I think I did a video a few, few actually many months ago now uh with uh what the six-time jiu-jitsu world champion angie right so she's she trains she's trained for you know so many years uh at gracie academy and um like the whole idea about like pinning so not just chest to chest right pinning pinning down different parts of their body that's gonna allow you to not only pass pass their guard Right, that's going to allow you to set up submissions, kind of just like how John Danaher was saying. Um, that's going to allow you so many opportunities that you can control, right? And so then that kind of, I think that kind of gets back to the whole idea of, you know, where jujitsu tries to claim that uh, they are about like that whole position over submission type thing. Um, so you can't be saying stuff like that, like position over submission, if you're just only thinking about, oh, I'm going to fall back and get you into a triangle, or I'm going to, you know, if you're only thinking about the submission, then maybe you're going to be forgetting about positions, right? So when you think about position now, think about pinning, right? Because I, I always, I always um, uh, try to, like, at least my mindset when 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 I, when I grapple a tenth planet or whatever or or any jujitsu school, 
um, is you think about pinning someone. And I, I'll, I'll give you one example of it just rolling in the gym. There, there's one guy who's got a lot of experience. So uh, try to maybe do some submissions. He always got out, right? He's always able to wiggle out. Uh, but then I went for a cradle pin, right? and that's when he tapped. So I thought that was really interesting because when you're kind of forgetting about uh, rolling with some of these uh, wrestling techniques, um, then you find out that it's like you're going to be hitting them with stuff that um, they're not used to seeing. And you know, I, I basically ended up kind of cranking this or put, putting too much pressure on the guy. So he submitted – because of that pressure, right, of, of the cradle pin, right? So really in wrestling, it's just a pin, but I got the submission, right? So that's another thing I wanted to kind of bring up um, is that, yeah, there, there's more aspects to pinning, right? So it's not like Dan Hare mentions the chest-to-chest -chest stuff, um, but then um, so there's more to it than that. And like I said, the different angles, the different ways of pinning, Right, a lot of times we put a lot of people into like, kind of like that Baron Bolo position with the pin, where it's basically just the tops, the tops of their shoulders onto the mat, and they're in yoga it's called like plow pose. So basically, yeah, you know your your head is your, the back of your head is on the mat, you're looking face up, and then your the rest of your body is curled in front of your face, so your chin is chuck, tucked in to your ribs. These are different types of a lot of times cradle pins, right? That happen, or um, uh, we have. Uh, we call it, I call it the Lancashire Crucifix. Uh, maybe we should do a video on that. Um, it's a real painful neck crank, but it makes the person um, go with, uh, where their feet are in the air and the tops of their shoulders are on the mat. Uh, a lot of times they'll, not only are they pinned, but it's just so uncomfortable that they will submit because of all, all that pressure on their neck. So it's kind of a neck crank at the same time. So, um, like I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of using, like how Danaher says, pinning is a weapon. So learn it and use it, right? And you're free to learn from us. I'm totally fine. Um, we also have, you know, if you're not in LA, we have the online training program on our website, catchwrestlingalliance.com. We call it CWA Academy. Um, I can't, I can't. Uh, tell you uh, just how valuable it is and how much a part of catch wrestling it is. And that's the other thing too. It's like, I think a lot of people have misunderstandings about what catch wrestling is too, because you see people putting out all these kind of what we call show holds. So stuff that probably won't even work in a real match against, against an experienced person doing all these crazy things uh, that don't involve wrestling principles. And then ultimately it gives catch wrestling a bad name or you know, I've spoken with many people, um, even some professional MMA fighters where they thought very little of catch wrestling because of a lot, all these uh, show holds that you see on YouTube and stuff all the time. All right. Um, so also I think um, if you guys look at the, the interview that I just put out with uh, Black Belt from Brazil, Thiago. Um, uh, he'll, he'll talk about a bunch of different things like that. And we, and we kind of discuss like Luta Libre in Brazil, how uh, a lot of people talk about how it was started by a catch wrestler, but Luta nowadays, re and I think, I think very quickly it lost the whole pinning aspect. So it really kind of just looks like um, kind of like Nogi with maybe some neck cranks and stuff like that. So we, we talk about that in the video that I put out yesterday. <laughs> So usually I wait a little while before I put out talking head videos, but I couldn't, I couldn't wait. This just happened. I wanted to just, you know, do a live stream last night, but figured I'd wait for today. Um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, get to this comment here. So Maceo, uh, Carlson Gracie, Black Belt, Mario Spiri in his Valetudo two series win over pins. He uses in BJJ from side control and north south. He also showed how to transition from position to position, right? So if you got these famous jiu-jitsu people uh, discussing the importance of pinning, right, then why are people arguing against it? That's kind of, that's why it's absurd, at least to me, right? There's so much value in there. The, there is kind of a thing, like 
uh, feel free to chime in because actually this is something I've been thinking about. So I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts uh, about the value of amateur wrestling. All right. So um, we, there is a value, say, like, uh, the, like for folk style, um, uh, where it's like you, you kind of you want to teach children the, like the principles of wrestling. Right. So by by teaching them folk style in particular, I like folk style a little bit better for teaching wrestling principles than uh, freestyle, because in freestyle, uh, if you get thrown out to the ground, you want to pancake out. So you like the parterre position. It's like uh, that's not that's not wrestling. That's not fighting. Right. In MMA, if you're just like pancaked out, you're just going to they're going to do a back mount. Right. And then just punch you until until the ref calls it. Right, so that's why I feel like um, folk style because you you if you get thrown down, you try to get back into referee's position, right? So back on your hands and knees, you try to counter them, or you can stand back up. So I think that's more valuable for uh, not only catch wrestling and and also um, no gi, but also MMA. So that's why I prefer that. There's the Indian style. I'm probably gonna pronounce it wrong, but gusti or kushti. I say that the spelling different in different places. Um, been watching some of that, and my good friend John Strickland on the East Coast. He's also been watching a bunch of that, and that looks uh, really similar to the, the catch wrestling principles. Uh, even though it's still, you know, they still have their own separate rules that are not catch wrestling, but a lot of the principles are are there and and, and are the same. So, so that's why. Uh, I kind of like, I, I like those things, but going back to my original question for you guys is like, well, if, since we have the Olympics and we have even like these, like now we're having more and more like pro, like a, who's number one in freestyle, right? These different events like on flow grappling and all that. Uh, and it, it's great for, uh, to, you know, to get these really great world-class freestyle people paid and all that. But is like is there enough people who are fans of that or do you think like long term because like it already almost got eliminated from the olympics and for for many reasons but one of the reasons is like lack of interest as well like do you think that that might fade out over the years still even though like uh it, you know there was like a big uh rally to kind of get it back into the olympics right and so it did but you think ultimately, because I mean, there's no submission holds, uh, there's definitely no striking and all that. Um, you think that that, like, even Greco-Roman and all that, like, you think that they might fade out over the over the years? You think they might be ultimately eliminated, and maybe even no gi gets put in there? Like, what what are your guys' thoughts? Let me see. What are we? <laughs> yeah, isn't there pinning in judo and sambo? Um, I, I know that there's definitely pinning in judo. You got to hold the person down uh, for like 20 seconds, I believe. So that's why I think that's why I really get along with the, the judo uh, students that I have that, that, you know, come. I have a couple of judo instructors that train with me. And um, like, I think they understand the value of pins. And uh, so that's, I, I think that's why we get along. Right? <laughs> right? Because they're, they're definitely not the ones that are going to be talking about, um, um, or complaining about like being forced to be on your back, right? Or getting pinned, right? They, I think they understand the value of getting back up or getting off your back, right? So, um, yeah, no, no complaints from judo people that I've heard. All right. Uh, Hala, uh, how do you grade someone to become a black belt in your academy? So, and I'm good. I'm, I'm glad you put, put it in quotations, right? But, um, yeah, so the way it's the way it's set up in our academy, I put like two fundamentals courses and plus a few uh, extra courses in there. So, but the main thing you focus on is the are the fundamentals courses. So we have one that's all the takedowns, and then another one that's are the are these the fundamental takedowns, and then the other one is the fundamental ground techniques. And uh, once you go through those two, then you submit to me a video of you doing that, and then after you pass. Um, pass those uh, like uh, successfully, then I'll give you access to more advanced lessons. So um, it's already it's all set up already, and uh, um, 
So just let me know. We all, we also did something where you can since we're um, since we have like the the paywall here as well. Like you can become a member of this channel. Uh, there's different tiers that you can join at. So there's all these extra videos that we put on only here that are like uh, behind the scenes stuff. Also uh, just extra stuff that like different presentations we've done. Like there's one that we did a presentation for the public at um, Humboldt, Iowa, which is the home of Frank Gotch. And we did um, a big demonstration for the people there in the park where Frank Gotch himself used to train. He used to train in public, right? In that in this park at that time, it was called Riverside Park. And um, like thousands of people would gather. They would come from like all over the state, all over the country just to watch him train. And we did a presentation there of catch wrestling, which uh, really historic. So all that stuff is like, uh, if you become a member of this channel, that you can see all that stuff. Um, but we have a, t a third tier where, you know, if you, if you join at that tier, then you can have access to these videos plus the, the Catch Wrestling Alliance Academy. So, but if you do that, just let me know, because then I have to enroll you. And just <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's all it is. You just sign up for that. Uh, send me your email and uh, you'll, you'll be enrolled in both. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Mar Marceo, I always ask catch guys if they train fighting off their back, but they never give me a straight answer. Uh, what do you mean by fighting? If it's MMA stuff, sure. But the thing is, uh, uh, like if you're watching MMA nowadays, I think people aren't recognizing this enough, but a lot of people are uh, using wrestling to get back up to standing, right? So they're not just staying there, keeping someone in guard and trying to trade punches. Uh, they're actually turning over to referee's position, getting into tripod position and standing back up, right? So I think that counts as fighting off your back, right? Because you're, you're trying to improve your position and you're trying to be like what they say, like defending yourself intelligently. What's more intelligent than that? Because uh, when we talk about brain trauma, right, the, the MMA is considered one of the worst sports for brain trauma because if you're on your back facing your opponent, they punch you. So you get this strike to your brain and then your head goes back and hits the mat. That's two strikes, right? In kickboxing, right, and what bare knuckle boxing came out with a study that, that like, were they excited about a study showing that bare knuckle boxing is less trauma to your brain because if you're both standing and you get hit, you just get that one hit because you're allowed. Like, if you if you get blown back by the hit, you don't get hit by anything else behind you, right? Um, so MMA has got you got two hits, right? So it's best to get out from that two hits situation, right? Okay, so let's see. Yeah, yeah, Anthony. Um, Anthony Martinez, historically speaking, I recall hearing that pinning was, uh, was focused on because of armor. An armored opponent would have to be held down. Yeah, I think there's a, I've, I've heard that too, but uh, we also have to remember that so many, um, traditional styles around the world kind of value the whole, the takedown and you're done or, or, or take down and pin and you're done. So I know all of them didn't necessarily have armor, but I mean, uh, I think that's, that's something I've heard. And I think it's a, a valid point where it's like, you can be held down, but in a, in a street fight, right? If you're up against uh, a couple people, one of them can hold you down and the other one can just kill you, right? The other one can stab you through your armor or nowadays since we don't wear, we don't walk around wearing armor all the time. Uh, yeah, it's really easy if someone holds you down and you have to, and their buddy can uh, take your wallet or, or just stab you, all right? All right, so the, the, I think people have to kind of think of that as well and like not necessarily, and then I think that idea can go back to, um, what is it, Maceo's question about, um, fighting off your back, I mean, yeah, you can maybe throw a couple punches here and there, but if you can work to get back into a more, a stronger position, right? Like we're at, or even if you can get back to standing, that might be more of a, a way to think about fighting off your back. All right. 
there are a lot of easy counters to chokes like bridging. So uh, do you follow the way, says. There are a lot of easy counters to chokes like bridging. It's very difficult to choke a wrestler who learns basic guards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, there's these other wrestling principles. Yeah, bridging, oh, super good, super good. Um, that that can also get you out of side control, um, especially if you're if your opponent is just like on their knees, like have you they have you in side control and they're on their knees. Uh, you know, if you're used to bridging, you got a strong strong back, strong neck, you'll bridge out of that, no problem. Uh, but it takes practice because you just got to get used to it. Um, yeah, so good point there. So Hala, I am happy you are talking about this. So you only become really proficient at getting back up with the tripod, or do you also have sweeps? Oh yeah, catch <laughs> catch wrestling is all about the counter, right? And so uh, you'll you'll hear about um, a lot early. If you hear some of the old timers speak, they always talk about the counter to the counter, right? So if you get taken down, there's usually a counter to that. But then uh, if you're up against a really great grappler right, or a great catch wrestler, there would be a counter to that counter, right? So there's a lot of back and forth or like what people in jiu-jitsu call like the flow, right? There's all this back and forth flow that, that happens in catch wrestling that I think people, uh, they've asked me about over the years because I think they're just so unfamiliar with catch wrestling that they ask like, oh, does it have a flow like, like, uh, like jiu-jitsu? And yeah, of course, of course. And, uh, but I think, it would be a wrestling-like flow, right, with bridges and and also a lot of. I don't know if you guys have seen like when uh, I like my favorite move is um, a lot of times you guys call it a fat man roll <laughs> in in England it's called a fire elbow where it's like if you do get thrown over, um, if you get taken down, you're on your back but you can roll over and you take their wrist and as you roll, you throw the person over you and you end up back on top. So you're the one pinning them all of a sudden. So uh, that's like one of my favorite moves. I've, you know, I've got it and I don't know if you guys, I mean, if you guys, uh, the, I, I did it on someone who's like over a hundred pounds heavier than me. We sh I think it was shared on social media. Uh, one of my good friends, who's also a really popular comedian, David Lucas, um, he shared it on his social media. Like, so he, he's a, he was his state folk style champ when he was in high school. And so we rolled. And uh, they, they filmed that, so he, uh, he anyway, I, I countered him using that. And even though he's like over 100 pounds heavier than me, he's taller than me, I was still able to get that. So um, I think that's I think that's on this channel too. I think I've put that up on this channel. Uh, go ahead and look down. It's it's on those uh, those 15 second vertical short videos. I put that out on there too, so you can see that on this channel as well. Like we have a lot of counters. Uh, from underneath, and it's not just tripoding and standing back up. Uh, there, there's a lot, it, and and uh, they they're really I'd say they're really cool. They're really beautiful. It's because it's all proper body mechanics. It's not muscling anybody. I think that's the other thing that people uh, say with regards to wrestling in general and catch wrestling that it's like power moves, and you know maybe we got some bodybuilders or some some buff dudes doing catch wrestling, or, and you see a lot of buff guys doing pro wrestling, right? Uh, so I think that kind of lends to that idea where it's just like, oh, these are all strength moves, strength and power. Um, it's not exactly like that. It's usually like leverage, right? You can be really strong in a bridge because you're using your whole body. You're using your legs. Your legs are super strong. You can pick up tons of weight. It was even a, a small woman can, you know, using her leg power can do a lot of damage, right? But yeah, it's in the legs. And then also too, like, so going back to the whole idea of pinning, or if you're using your legs, you're using you know, the balls of your feet, you're driving into the mat, driving forward, you know, driving into the ribs at an angle. Oh, it's going to, that's, that's going to cause a lot of discomfort. That's what can cause the ribs to crack or get them to submit just by, just because you're, uh, you're not allowing the lungs to expand. So you're kind of getting a, a suffocation thing going on too. All right, glad you guys are really uh, asking questions. Let's get to this. Okay. Um, so, Jay, in my catch school, we do learn some submissions from the back, 
but we do a lot of live drilling when we get taken down to try to get back up. At the back is the worst case scenario. Yeah, uh, do you follow the way? Turning your back to an opponent isn't a very dangerous position if you're working to stand back up, right? Great point. And I think, this is like, like I said earlier, this is something that's kind of uh, not being recognized, but it's happening, happening a lot in MMA. People are using the whole tripod position to get back up. I think it's not being recognized so much because, on at least online, based on a lot of comments I'm seeing, uh, people giving their opinion saying like, oh, you, you give your back. Oh, you're going to get choked out and this and that. And it's like, uh, no, it, like it's happening all the time. <laughs> or is it, maybe not all the time in every fight, of course, but it's happening so frequently in MMA. And I think people aren't recognizing that. It's like giving your back to someone um, isn't, isn't automatically uh, leading to getting choked out. And we have that, that match. Uh, I think I did a live stream about that. Gary Tonnen against a low-level grappler. He was on the guy's back, unable to finish him. Guy was able to get back up. And anyway, so and also uh, he, you know, basically was able to just use some basic wrist control to prevent all of Gary's submissions. Right? I think Gary still won that fight, but still, still he didn't finish the guy. And and um, they were billing it as like Gary was going to finish this guy, or because he was just like a karate guy. And no offense to karate, <laughs> but the, I believe that the guy, the karate guy, uh, was not was not striking well. I mean, I think he probably could have knocked out, or I, he should have knocked out. It was uh, Gary, Gary Tonnen. Right? He he like that match was totally just for him to lose because he was able to get back to standing several times, and when they got back to standing, that's when you 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 kick, you punch, you know, throw some uppercuts. Right? If Gary Gary likes to uh, drop down to kind of do um, not necessarily Imanari rolls, but like diving uh, single leg stuff, you know, use those uppercuts. They, they work really well for when people like, you know, people die or, or level change real fast. Um, the karate guy, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, <laughs> but now like he, he let himself down. <laughs> he should have, I think he, he totally had, so many opportunities to win that fight. That's that's my two cents, right? Uh, do you follow the way? I used to roll with a guy, Sam, who was 130 or 135, and he would toss me around with all kinds of different takedowns, right? Have you ever rolled with someone in from Iran or India? Um, no, I'm not sure. I do know people from Iran um who trained uh who, who trained freestyle at Wigan oh no 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 sorry it's not Iran it's Pakistan Pakistan sorry so maybe not maybe not uh, I do one of my uh, one of my students in China uh went to Iran to to train uh to practice some wrestling and judo there yeah and and then they, they were uh she was telling me that they do kind of emphasize a lot of the stand-up takedowns and stuff uh, but yeah, no, they're serious, especially in freestyle. Iran's one of the best countries in freestyle. Well, how are you? you? You saw the, you ended up seeing the video that I was talking about where I was able to roll over someone that who is like way bigger than me. I'm glad you saw it. Um, yeah, yeah, you can. So that's what I'm saying. It's like this stuff is not about muscling so much, but it's about no, like practicing it so much so you know when it feels right to do it. And then you can you can do it even if someone's larger than you, right? And and, and experience. So David in particular, he is not a beginner, right? He was a state champ in folk style, right? And um, um, he knows wrestling fundamentals, right? So, and he was still able to get rolled over. So do you know the way? I was 18 and 160 pounds. Sam did one takedown with head control and a knee tap that took him right into a cradle. Yep. So, yeah, there, there's much more sophistication than I think people give wrestling credit for. Um, and there's much more sophistication in catch wrestling as well because uh, folk style and all these amateur styles come from catch wrestling, or well, at least folk style and freestyle in particular. 
Uh, Steve, I like the Sanda shirt. Wish they had catch and Sanda in my area. Training judo, but just Zoom classes now because of COVID. Judo is my favorite, but would love to add catch. All right, well, thank you for liking the Sanda shirt. Actually, uh, I made this. <laughs> uh, so um, actually, we do have a Sanda channel, like a kickboxing channel. It's called Kung Fu Culture. So, uh, you know, Kung Fu spelled, you know, K-U-N-G-F-U, -U, and then culture spelled with a K. Uh, you can find that. Uh, so it's, I want to try to keep everything like wrestling oriented on this channel. So I decided to just put all the, the kickboxing stuff on that on that channel. And some of the some of the striking oriented oriented self defense stuff on that on that channel as well. Um, so you guys can look at that as well, or if you can subscribe to that, that'd be great. Um, uh, and yeah, if you also if you have any requests on stuff for that channel, um, you know, please let me know. Um, I want to try to add more stuff to that because a lot of people are watching that one too. So um, uh, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Um, Hala asks a good question. Uh, how many moves approximately do you need to master in catch to become proficient at it? A lot of, actually, um, you just have to understand orientation, really. You got to know, you don't want to be face up on the mat. <laughs> and so if you're face up, you got to find your ways to get back face down. Uh, some people you can you can uh, maybe in, you have another option you know to try to break out and stand back up, but just remember when you stand back up, a lot of times you're neutral again, right? So uh, if you stand back up, you got to find ways to maybe keep wrist control or something so that you can uh, stand up and maybe turn it into some kind of counter throw or something like that. Um, but um, a lot of a lot of styles can be broken down into the fundamental um, uh, positions, right? And then everything else would, would like every technique or counter move and stuff is a uh, offshoot from these different positions, right? So like someone earlier mentioned bridging, that's also a really important position or a really important way to get off your back, right? And um, so getting from uh, back to the mat, to back, uh, or at least your, your chest to the mat, then there's different ways to do that. But you want to try to think simply, right? Even with striking, I, I kind of talk about the same same things about that. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm a two-time Sanda champion for the United States. Uh, so I know a little bit about striking, I, I think. Right? <laughs> so that's why I feel comfortable talking about striking. But I kind of see it in the same type of uh, way. You really want to keep think super simple. Um, I actually use like a, a Tetris analogy where you have different shapes that kind of fit into different uh, spaces. So that's how I kind of view striking. Um, so I kind of view wrestling kind of similarly where uh, there's, there's ways you don't want to be. And so you got to figure out ways to get out of the positions that you shouldn't be in. Right. And, and so uh, there's plenty of, there's others, thousands and thousands of techniques, right? But ultimately to be good, I think you wanna to try to think simply. And then as you uh, as you get more experience wrestling or striking, you know, kickboxing, fighting, um, then I think you'll realize that you'll return more to uh, breaking things down to being super simple, super basic. And you'll be able to pull off some of these highlight moves because you're thinking more simply and if you're staying relaxed and all, and there's so many things that go into it, like mindset and all that, but the more relaxed you are, the more you'll be able to find your opportunities to get, get into a better position. Right. And then you can add on all these different spectacular counter moves and all that. And they'll happen for you. Um, if you kind of uh, think simply, right. What, and actually, oh, so Anthony, thank you for this question. Because um, uh, actually a, a few people have been asking the same exact question. Um, so here it is. What daily drills would you recommend to do with a three-legged takedown dummy and a submission dummy? Thanks. Um, 
a three-legged takedown dummy. Interesting. <laughs> Maybe that helps you to helps it to stand up on its own. I guess. Um, okay. So um, yeah, you you gotta use. Um, I, I'd say duck unders. That's one of the main things you can do. Duck unders to get used to changing your level, right? Because the level changes. The, is, that's what's going to help you be successful with uh, getting control of their body. You know, getting past the the defense of their arms, right? So duck unders. So just work on level change, getting the, the arm over your head. You can come around behind them, right? Or you can lower your level, go for that double leg, uh, go for a single leg. But a lot of it comes from that level change. Right, so if you have like a three-legged dummy where it's standing up on its own, duck under. So level change, level change, level change. Uh, then yeah, you can try um, again. Even the level change works for someone mentioned earlier, where uh, a knee tap. Same thing. You can you can get like an overhook on your dummy, right? And then level change. So bring them down, and that's that's the idea where it's like you kind of get them to shift forward and on, like get their weight onto the lead leg. And then you can do a more successful knee tap. That's kind of like how, how, it, how it's going to work for you. Uh, so it's all, it all kind of goes back to that level change, right? So you make them bear your weight if you're hanging on to them, or if you're going to try to, uh, if they're kind of a, kind of doing a collar tie up with you, you can get the arm out of the way and then you level change. You get out, you get out from, uh, from that, that their defense, right? So you, you go under it. Right, or you can also try to practice snap downs where they're coming at you. You can practice your timing, snapping them down, getting into a headlock, and then pulling them down. Those are some of the main things you can do um, with regards to the 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 submission dummy. Then um, uh, yeah, work work on your neck cranks, your toe holds, uh, breaking them down. So you can you can put the dummy into referee's position, right? So like when they're on their hands and knees and you, or even in turtle, since uh, a lot of you guys do jujitsu or grappling or nogi, then you can, you can put the dummy into a defensive position and you can work on all the different ways of breaking them down. So you can work on the ball and chain ride or, uh, you know, call it barbed wire, where it's like, you know, you reach across their face, you grab their far arm and then you pull it across their face and you get them to roll over face up, especially since we're talking about Pinning, right? Pinning as a weapon. Uh, and if you got that dummy, and you know, I know it's COVID now, and um, some major cities around the world are in lockdown. Um, yeah, stay safe. Use the use these dummies. Work on your pinning. All right. Hala, thanks for thanks for the explanation. Is your son the MMA stand MMA a standalone course, or is it also part of the academy? Which courses are standalone in your academy? So yeah, the the Sanda one, uh, the Sanda MMA one is a standalone one. Uh, I was thinking about maybe making that one into kind of like a whole separate thing. Where so right now it's just a lot of takedowns for common striking attacks and follow through. So like we do some uh, follow through to leg locks or follow through to passing passing their guard, right? Um, but because uh, uh, well, but one of the, my ideas is maybe just trying to continue building on that or continue adding to that so that can be a, a separate thing. But let me know because uh, um, I still, like, unfortunately, like, when I was doing Sanda, it was much more popular in, in the United States. Uh, and then it just really faded. But it's, it's still popular in other parts of the world. So, um, so I think right now Americans aren't quite familiar with it. So I think as it grows, I want to maybe try to add more and more to that in particular. But if you, if you and then maybe adding something where someone who wants to do both, then maybe I can link link them together for them. So uh, just let me know if, if you want that, then totally work out something for you. All right. So uh, any more questions about pinning? Or do you guys understand the value of pinning? Please, please say yes. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I just couldn't let that this moment pass uh, without mentioning the what what John Danaher said because it's like a great validation uh, of what I've been saying for years. And I was making, I was kind of joking around on social media where it's like he must listen to my podcast, um, but you know, probably not, right? <laughs> but um, um, it, he makes a valid point, and I think there's more to it than even he's than what he wrote in his his blurb about his couple his paragraph. 
Um, so hopefully I can kind of um, uh, fill in some of the, the blanks, right, that he might have omitted. Yeah. Uh, one more question here. So uh, from, do you follow the way? Do you teach side control neck cranks? Pinning is great for learning ground control. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, because all the side control neck cranks um, really go towards, you know, you, like you can hold them down and pin them or you can submit them uh, while you're in side control. So yeah, yes. To answer your question, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think we might have some of those on here. If not, maybe we'll try to give you guys a couple in some of the technique videos. We do have another technique video coming out this week. I know it's Christmas, so uh, maybe no one will watch it. <laughs> but uh, if you have a chance, I'll probably put that one out on Friday. Um, so it's after, or I don't know. We'll, we'll see. All right, thank you for uh, coming to the Q&A. All right, so um, let me know uh, if anybody has any other questions, ask now. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and call this one because uh, it's already after 45 minutes. So hopefully you guys aren't too tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> okay, so um, I think I got my point across and I'm really, I'm really glad for all of you guys who came into the chat. Um, I think it was a really good discussion. And uh, I think, yeah, I think all you... I'm happy, I'm actually happy for you guys, or I'm happy that you guys are here because I think you guys all seem to be on the same page or at least are open to learning a little bit more about the different aspects of wrestling um, and its, its value for grappling in general. Like even though grappling in general or nogi doesn't have the pin, but the pin itself or kind of keeping the whole idea of pinning somebody, it can be valuable. And uh it can lead to, like how John Danaher says, it can lead to a submission, right? You can then control better when you get when you go for that submission, right? And like he says, you let them cook or let them uh, stew for a little bit, right? So keep those things in mind. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, consider becoming a member of this channel. Um, or if you want to learn catch wrestling, you can become a member of our academy. All right? Thank you.